Hello there, my name's Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. So I want to look at ultra wideband. What is it? How does it work? And what does it mean for consumers? So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Now, while ultra wideband technology has been around for a number of years, it's come to the forefront because it's been adopted now in popular smartphones. First of all, was the iPhone 11 that had the U1 chip in it, which is an ultra wideband chip. And now it's also in the Note 20 Ultra, which means it's beginning to take footing in both the Apple ecosystem and in the Android ecosystem. Of course, it's only the beginning, but now is a good time to understand what does ultra wideband do? How does it work? And what will it mean for us? It's radio, Jim, but not as we know it. That's the title I've given this slide because we are used to particular types of radio, uh, AM radio, FM radio, phase shift keying, which we find in Bluetooth. Now, they're all ways of modulating, modifying a radio wave that's already following a kind of a sine wave. So you can modify the amplitude, that's the signal strength, you can modify the frequency, and then you can modify the phase, and there are other things that, that can be combined with uh, other types of modulation as well. So this is what we do, we start with this signal that is this sine wave, and then you modify it to carry the information. And that's what we're used to for many, many types of radio, including Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and normal radio like AM and, and FM and so on. But UWB is quite different. So UWD uses pulses. So rather than modifying a radio wave that follows the form of a sine wave, this actually sends out very short pulses, one after the other. In fact, they can be up to just two nanoseconds apart. And you don't need to worry about the wave so much, more the fact that it went up and then it went down. And you can actually modify how this actual pulse looks like. There are about four different ways. This is kind of just the standard straight up, straight down one. There are some kind of inverted ones and so on. But that's not important. The point is they're pulses. So beep, 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 beep kind of thing, rather than trying to actually carry the information on a radio wave that's following the sign shape. And so if we look at the uh, frequencies that are used, that's the uh, x-axis here on the bottom, by normal stuff. We can see GPS there, we've got 2.4 gigahertz, of course we've got Bluetooth and you've got Wi-Fi, and then we've got 5 gigahertz where you've got the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, and you can look at the power, uh, that's the uh, uh, y-axis there, you can see they're all pretty high, and when I say pretty high I mean um, it, you know, compared to what we're talking about. Actually, they're only 100 milliwatts, which is not very much at all. However, the point to notice here is that minus 40 dBm, and I've got a whole video on how you interpret dBm's over on Android Authority when I talk about 5G uh, power levels. So you should go and watch that video if you're not familiar with this. But basically, there is a noise floor. That's basically background noise. You're getting all this kind of background noise from all the different radio waves that are going around. And there is a defined limit. And the thing about UWB is, first of all, it stays under that limit. So it's very, very low power. In fact, we're talking about less than one milliwatt. And we'll also look what kind of range it covers. Not does it just five gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz like we get with Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth. This starts at 3.1 gigahertz and go all the way up to 10 gigahertz. It's a huge area that it can use. And the reason it uses that huge area is because it's underneath this threshold of what would be kind of the noise level. So if it's in that space, it doesn't need to be licensed. You don't need to have permission to use it because the power levels are so low that they say, well, this can't interfere with anything. So it's very, very uh, low down and you don't need to get a special license from you know, a, a, a state organization or whatever to, 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 quant to you know, approve your, uh, your use of this radio power because it's very, very small. And also it's so wide, so there's a huge area that you can choose from where you want to place your channels and what you want them to do. And we'll talk more about the width uh, in a moment as well. Now, most wireless systems use a central frequency and then a few megahertz either side, and that's what we call a band. It's actually quite a narrow band. So typically somewhere between 20, 80 megahertz, maybe 160 megahertz. So for example, we talked about Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz. So the very first one, 802.11.b, uses a 22 megahertz channel. So it's very, very narrow. You've got your 2.4 gigahertz and you can go 22 megahertz either side inside of the actual channels that are being defined. There are, what, 13, 14 channels for, for Wi-Fi in around the 2.4 gigahertz. Now, ultra wideband uses 500 megahertz as a minimum, as a minimum, and it can go up to 1.3 gigahertz or 1,300 
megahertz. That's a huge area. So if you picked an area like 3.1 gigahertz and you can go right up to 3.6 gigahertz, you can cover a whole area and you can transmit your signals, all those pulses in that whole big uh, section. And that, that gives you quite an advantage for different reasons that we're going to talk about now. So let's just recap some of the features that we said. It goes from 3.1 gigahertz up to 10.6 gigahertz. There's also some one gigahertz uh, stuff that's floating around, though that's not really been implemented very much. Now, of course, we're talking very low power. Now, the theoretical maximum range in line of sight, which means, you know, clear open factory floor, maybe, or a clear field or something is 200 meters. But really the optimal range for when you want to do stuff kind of high speed is about 10 meters and of course you can go further away the data rates will drop out but 10 meters is a is a good kind of number to be thinking about and again because of those wide bandwidth that you've got there those wide you know up to 1.3 gigahertz you can get theoretical data rates up to 480 megabits a second. However, the currently defined standards tell you that it's basically you're going to get 27 megabits, uh, 27 megabits a second, which of course is greater than uh, Bluetooth, but not as good as what you're going to get with, for example, uh, Wi-Fi. But the other difference is, of course, here, low, low power, less than one milliwatt compared to, I uh, say, 100 milliwatts, which is what uh, Wi-Fi is. Now, all of this wideband stuff actually allows you to do great location uh, detection, location and ranging. And we can talk more about that in another slide. So basically down to the centimeter level, you can work out where something is because you've, first of all, got so many different pulses you're sending out. They're sending them out very, very quickly, two nanoseconds, which means they can be measured. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And it does play well with other wireless tech. For example, if you are around the five gigahertz barrier where there's other Wi-Fi, for example, or other radio signals around, this has technology built into it, like a low duty cycle that says, well, I've got to be on for a maximum of five milliseconds. Then I have to pause for 38 milliseconds. So it kind of allows other radio frequencies to kind of get a space. And it doesn't want to dominate. And of course, it can't really because of the power level as well. So what that means is really two important things. One is you get high accuracy location and ranging so better than you would with wi-fi and better than you would with traditional uh, bluetooth of course bluetooth now has got some uh, location stuff built into it as well and you can kind of think about radar type apps in the sense that you can send out these pulses and you can get pings back from things and because the pings back are coming at these two nanosecond intervals it's very very easy to calculate how far away different things are and we'll talk again more about that in a minute and the other thing that's really interesting is it's good for security because you can't spoof the so what you know there's these stories of people who have their car stolen because someone's relaying the information from the key fob on a very powerful antenna and then sending it towards the car, the car unlocks. Well, because this measures actual, the time that it takes the signal to go from one place to another, you can't do that because even if it passes through a relay, the physical time just keeps passing by. It's not time stamped on the on the packet, it's physical time goes past and you can't, and it knows how long it took for that signal to come back. So you know that you actually really are in proximity to the car or the door or whatever when you want to open it. Now, if tech like UWB ultra wideband interests you, maybe learning to code also interests you. So what about this, the ultimate learn to code bundle? It's only $39 at the moment. And look, all these courses, you get lots to do with web development, for example, Ruby on Rails, and then you've got JavaScript, and you've got the complete HTML5 and CSS3 course. You've got practical web programming. But then if you want more than just web programming, there's Python there, there's Java, there's how to write iOS apps with Objective-C. There's some stuff about databases. There's a whole load of stuff here. So if you find tech interesting, then maybe it's time you learn to write some code and this course could certainly get you on the way and if you buy it through the link which will be in the description you also help out this channel okay let's carry on so here is how it does the location uh, tracking there are three different ways but basically what they have here are three different uh, fixed stations so we're talking about let's say you're in an airport and there are three stations. Of course, there would be more. Three is a minimal for triangulation. That's why it's tri, because it's three, triple. Okay, and so there are different ways of doing it. And so they're called anchors. So you have these three anchors, and you walk in with some kind of 
a phone like a, a, an iPhone or you walk in with some kind of tag that can send this information. And there are three ways of doing it. One is that it, you can, the anchors send signals and the sensor then returns them and the distance is calculated by how long it takes the, the pulses to come back and forth. That's the first way. The second way is the sensor emits a signal which the anchors receive at different times depending on, on, on where they are and then they calculate the distance and this is uh, calculated using the time difference. Now both of these need the kind of the anchors and the phone to talk to each other as well. There needs to be some infrastructure and this one, the last one, is implemented with, with minimal infrastructure, kind of uh, you don't need so much uh, background background servers to kind of talk to each other. This is about this this angle of uh, the angle of entry. So it's in order to determine the sensor position, the phase difference between the received signals on the two antennas. So we're talking pretty clever stuff. This is how other locationing uh, technology works as well. And then it works out the angle. And then again with the other things, it can work the time and things. It can work out where things. So there are three different ways. Depends on how much infrastructure they want to to put in. So it depends on whether you're building a factory. For example, where you control all the infrastructure and it's everything, you know, in automation or whether it's something more more public, let's say, um, in, a, in a shopping store or something. But, you know, they have these different ways. And in each case, it can detect very closely the location of the particular UWB uh, chip or trans transceiver. So some examples of this would be indoor navigation down to centimeter accuracy in an airport. How do you get to your gate? It will it will guide you to your gate in a supermarket. How do you find a particular product or at least, you know, the dairy products or the vegetables or whatever in a shopping mall? Uh, maybe you need to get to a particular clothes shop and it can guide you there in a museum. This is quite an interesting one. It can tell you how to find. I remember I recently went, well, I say recently, a couple of years ago, went to uh, an, an art museum and I was keen to look at a few particular pictures and you know by the time you go through the you know the 12 floors and the huge space it's quite so this thing you say well actually you know go forward get in the lift go up you know it could direct you to the thing that you want to see and then with smartphones and this of course is what we're seeing now with uh, the, the uh, iphone and the uh, and the android who is nearby you uh, who do you want to in apple's case who do you want to send uh, an airplay file to based on who's nearest to you because you're probably not sending it to someone on the other side of the room you're having a conversation can I send you this file yeah sure and it's the person standing right next to you finding someone in a crowd you know you're at a, a sports event you're at a shopping mall you know two people need to meet up you, this these things can help you meet up and of course this is a classic one finding objects you know, I, I need my, I've lost my car keys, my suitcase, you know, whatever you need to find, they're able to, uh, the you know, U, uh, UWB is able to help you find that. And of course, that can be also combined with AR, talking to your phone so that as you move the phone around, the camera on the phone, it knows, like in a normal AR application, it knows which way you're pointing and it can kind of show an arrow or even highlight the object itself if it's got good object recognition built into it and uh now the rumor is of course that apple are releasing air tags it's only a rumor we will find out now i wonder whether their air tags are going to use uh, uwb we'll find out when they make their announcement if they make an announcement and i like this example that the nfl has been using uwb for camera tracking so and this is actually happens today so they have sensors in the shoulder pads of the players there's also a sensor in the ball which means two things. First of all, the cameras can swing to follow the ball very, very uh, easily because it's got that sensor built into it. And also, if you're there, you can get kind of enhanced results on a telephone, on a, on a tablet, uh, because you can find out about the plays and so on, because the, they're able to relay the information about each player on the field directly to your device, and you can kind of get that extra higher level of interaction. That's a real application that's happening today. And then the other one we talked about was hands-free access. So you don't have to worry about uh, spoofing because it really does need to be actually close because it's based on time of flight, the calculations of how long it took the signal to get there and the reply uh, to come back. And of course, another example would be finding your car uh, in a parking lot and companies like NXP uh, and Apple, of course, and uh, Volkswagen and many others are all working together to see how they can come up with some interesting uh, ideas on implementing uh, UWB uh, in, in, in the automotive industry. So, of course, here's the interesting question. Will it become ubiquitous? The thing is that Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are just about in every smartphone. Even if you buy a budget, I bought a very budget 
device, uh, 150 US dollars recently. Of course, it comes with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built into it. It's the lowest, kind of the low Android smartphone that you can get from a recognizable brand. Uh, and of course, it's got Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in it. There's just no, no question about that. Now, NFC isn't something you get in all devices, particularly in some geographical regions and also depending on the price of the phones. The NFC is kind of still an option, but it, it's certainly in mid-range phones upwards, it's kind of a standard feature. Now, UWB needs to be adopted at least as well as NFC. Of course, it would be great if it was adopted as much as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, because when you go to any hotel or you go to an airport or whatever, uh, restaurants, you know, there's, wi there's Wi-Fi available. It's because it, it's, it's everywhere. Now, if UWB became everywhere, that would help in turning it into a useful application. But of course, it really needs a killer app in the real world. So all this stuff I'm talking about is all very interesting. And, you know, it's very nice that the NFL uses it. And it would be nice if maybe I could ever afford a car that can have you know, kind of unlocking like that, but that ain't going to happen anytime soon. But if there was a kind of a killer app in the real world, then, you know, that would be really interesting. Of course, for that, you need interest from developers. So we need both developers, we need the phones to have it in, and we need the infrastructure to support it. Of course, those are three big hurdles to overcome. Now, some segments like healthcare, factory automation, they can do their own thing. They can use UWB. They can say it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and that's great, but we as consumers don't really care about that. It might be the right solution for their problems, but we're talking about here the uses that we can get from our smartphones. And one other thing to mention is the Apple-to-Apple -Apple uses of UWB are interesting. Okay, so if it's built into HomeKit, if it's built into the Apple Watch, if it's built into, you know, you can do Apple to Apple stuff, that's very interesting and that's important for people inside of the Apple ecosystem, but it's still a closed system. So Wi-Fi is supported by Apple and Wi-Fi is supported by just about everybody else, laptops and PCs and desktops and, uh, and you know, Chromebooks and smartphones and tablets, it's everywhere. So Apple to Apple is interesting, don't get me wrong, it is interesting and it does, lead, does sort of show the direction of the markets in some way, but unless it's adopted on a wider scale then it's not going to make this a kind of a universal solution so it'll, we've got to watch out for what Apple are doing but also watch out for what others are doing to see if it is something that uh, is going to become sort of sort of available everywhere as a universal solution okay that's it my name's Gary Sims this is Gary Explained I hope you enjoyed this video if you did please do like and subscribe okay that's it I'll see you in the next one